so hello again. I'd, I'd like to talk about uh, the proper way to implement uh, uh, scientific uh, data analysis uh, pipelines. Uh, my name is Ami, and I work at, uh, at Final uh, Financial Algorithms Company in Israel. So what is this uh, talk about? Well, if you do uh, uh, any data analysis in, in Python, then you know that once uh, you've actually assembled all of your data and loaded it into memory, and you have it in a nice uh, data structure, such as a NumPy array, then uh, Python offers uh, tremendously powerful libraries to do all sorts of stuff with your data, to analyze it and find patterns in it and, and plot it and, and so on. And just to name a few, there, there's NumPy and SciPy, uh, Panda, Scikit-Learn with its uh, many variants, uh, Mayavi, and, and many, many others. But as a data analysis uh, practitioner, I, I think that the entire data analysis uh, process includes also uh, many stages that, that complement this. So for example, at least a large part of my time is, is spent uh, just by trying to assemble the data from uh, all sorts of files, which many times come in, in different uh, formats. And, and just the assembly is, is a large thing. And also, we might want to perform uh, just very quick uh, preliminary uh, uh, analysis. like. You know, we have uh, two variables, and we just want to see if, if there's any correlation between them. And, and if we see that there is, then we'll throw uh, all, the, all the heavy guns at it. But, but just now we want to play with it and see if there's any signal there. And finally, uh, we might not want to uh, load all of the data into memory at all, uh, such as, as the case where we just want to aggregate the data, right? Like uh, we to find the correlation of, uh, between two variables or, or the sum or median and so on. There's no, there's no uh, uh, real uh, reason to to load the data into memory at the first in the first place if we just want to sum it up in something really small. So uh, I'd like to give uh, some, uh, some examples of uh, these complementary tasks which, which aren't covered by these excellent libraries I've, I've shown before. And, and in my experience, at least, uh, these, these tasks are fairly common. So uh, here's the first of these. Uh, suppose we have uh, two files containing uh, me meteorological uh, data. Uh, one contains uh, wind uh, velocity measurements and one uh, rain, rain, uh, intent rain uh, volume uh, measurements or something like that. And we'd like to exclude outliers, uh, like, you know, take the values that are way too big and, and wipe them out. And, uh, and after we've done that, uh, just uh, find a correlation between the two to see, to see whether the wind and the rain have anything to do with each other at all. And if they do, then, then we'll start analyzing it to a greater extent. And now, uh, the second example, uh, w which I think is uh, pretty common too, is, is something like aggregating uh, similar row columns in, in a CSV file. So here's a CSV file. Uh, it has uh, rows, and, and each row uh, indicates the day a measurement was uh, made, and then, then measurements for the wind, the rain, and, and the snow, for example, in this case. Now, you can see that uh, on some days, more than a single uh, measurement was uh, made. Like, on the first day, the, the wind was uh, measured to be 10 and also measured to be 12 and, and so on. And what we'd like to do is to aggregate these consecutive similar rows in, into something smaller. So, so once we group them, we'd like to say that on the first day, the average uh, wind measurement was uh, 9.97, and on the second day, it was 10 and so on. And once we have a much uh, smaller uh, array, that, then we'll start processing it. So these uh, might look like a small task, but, but I think uh, that, that many data practitioners uh, spend a lot of time uh, doing these things before the fun begins, and, and you can really, really analyze the, the data in depth. Um, so what are the common attributes of the two examples I've, I've shown? So the libraries I've uh, spoken about before are, are very good at offering very complex uh, functionality, like uh, bootstrapped random forests and, and very heavy machinery. But in this case, uh, what we have are really a simple, of, a very, very, uh, a series of extremely simple uh, steps. And what we need is a way to uh, flexibly combine the steps where each one by itself is, is pretty simple in a manner that is, that is very uh, flexible. So uh, when we have uh, sequences of uh, steps and we want to combine them, then we know from the Linux uh, command line that uh, a fun and, and convenient way of doing it is uh, by using uh, pipe notation. So for example, uh, on the Linux uh, shell, we could, uh, we could use a cat to concatenate a file. And we might uh, pipe on the result to, to grep to search for a certain uh, pattern. And uh, we might pipe on the, the result uh, to word count to see how many, how many patterns uh, we found of uh, this thing. So using an extended uh, pipeline uh, syntax, uh, the, um, I can write the previous two examples. And I'd like to focus here on the first one, uh, which was 
going uh, over the two uh, files, removing outliers, and finding correlations between them. And uh, using the extended uh, pipeline syntax, what uh, what it says here is that the correlation between the wind and the rain is the result uh, is the result of streaming the values in one file, the the wind file, and streaming the the results in the other file, the rain file. And then taking both of these and passing on it, them on through a filter whose precondition is that for any wind and, and rain tuple, then both the wind value and the rain value needs to be less than 10, because otherwise it's considered an outlier. And then piping it on to a correlation stage that'll act actually compute the, the correlation. So you can see that what I'm aiming for is, is not a, an external tool, but, but rather something that yields a valid uh, Python expression. And you can actually uh, play, uh, play with this both in scripts and directly from the command line, like, like to perform very quick uh, data analysis. And once you get the hang of, uh, of these pipes, then you can see that, that you can think of many, many reusable uh, and useful uh, stages uh, to write. So, for example, uh, uh, you can think of the group of, of IO stages, the ability to both uh, read and write and, and parse CSV files, binary files, XML files, and, and so on. Uh, control control uh, stages, uh, um, you want to decide, let's say, that you're sampling only part of the data stream or skipping the beginning of it or skipping the end of it and, and so on. Uh, aggregate, uh, summarizing up uh, your data, finding the minimum value, the maximum value, mean, standard deviation, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, signal processing, which has a lot to do with, with the previous talk, uh, basically any, any FIR uh, filter you can, you can think of. Uh, econometrics and any possible econometric uh, transformation, uh, plotting, and, and so on and so forth. So I think there, there are relatively many reusable stages that, that you can write. So the focus of this talk is, is like this. There, um, there's been a pair of really good talks by, by David Beasley, who fortunately is, is sitting uh, right here in the, in the audience, on, uh, on different uh, ways to, to combine very simple tasks and pipe the results from, from one to the other. And uh, I'd like to consider uh, about three alternatives and, uh, and to look at their, uh, their various uh, trade-offs. So in order uh, to do so, um, uh, what we're going to do now is to look at the usage uh, scenario. What, what, what are we looking for in these types? And then to briefly, briefly review the available language con uh, constructs, what Python gives us. And then we'll combine the two and, and see what, what uh, fits. And what I'd like to argue is that in this particular uh, context, we should be using uh, coroutines and not, not generators. OK, so the usage uh, consideration. So how will these uh, pipes uh, be used? So the first thing I think that, that comes to mind is uh, memory footprint, because contemporary data sets are huge. And, and we cannot expect uh, uh, necessarily to be able to load them entirely into memory, at least not if we want to operate efficiently. So what we'd like to do is to build uh, the framework so that uh, each uh, stage processes the stream in, in chunks without necessarily loading it all to the memory. And, and uh, the total memory requirement of, of the pipe uh, should be this proportional to the size of the chunks, not to the size of the entire data stream. So going back to the two examples of before, the first one, for example, was going over two files and, uh, and finding the correlation exclu excluding outliers between them. So in this case, we could get away with uh, even as little as, as something like two numbers, right? Because to find the correlation, we need to track very, very little. So we shouldn't need to load these two streams uh, into memory ju just so we should be able to call sci-fi as a correlation function. That, that won't work uh, fast at all. And in the second example where we're taking uh, data and, and aggregating consecutive uh, uh, days data into chunks, then we end up uh, with, uh, with a list whose, whose size is proportional to the number of chunks. So the memory requirement shouldn't need to be proportional to the size of the original data, uh, uh, data set, but rather to the number of distinct uh, days that, that we had. OK, um, another very important uh, consideration, I think, is of the topology. So traditionally, pipelining is linear in the sense that each stage is sent of, uh, elements from its most one stage, and it sends elements to at most one following stage. So for example, here, cat is sent no values. It sends values to exactly one stage, which is graph, which gets exactly uh, uh, one input and sends it exactly to one output, and, and that's a terminal uh, stage. But uh, I'd like to argue that in the uh, context of scientific data processing, that that's not expressive enough, and we need something more. So here's why. Uh, many things in data mining are, are defined in the sense of uh, an operation taking two inputs and, and performing something uh, on them. So 
even if we think of something as simple as a correlation, a correlation is something that, that can get two inputs, maybe originating from, from different files in possibly completely different formats. And both of them do something which I'd like to call fan in. They, they both fan into a correlation state, which you can see on the left. And conversely, if we'd like to uh, um, efficiently aggregate a file, then, then we might want to say that in order to calculate the mean of the values of the file and the standard deviation and so on and so on, we, we shouldn't need to go over the file multiple times. So what we'd like to do here is something which, which I'll call fan out, which means I want to stream over, the, over all the values of the file and then to broadcast the, the results simultaneously to, to different aggregates. So these are such uh, basic operations that, that I think that without them, uh, the, uh, the framework just wouldn't be expressive enough. And um, uh, recursively, you can uh, use this to build uh, relatively complex expressions. Like here it says that, that I'd like to uh, uh, use a source uh, zero and uh, to fan the result of uh, piping source one into filter uh, zero, pipe both of them uh, into uh, filter one, and, and so on and so on. Uh, it's possible to create quite complex things. Then uh, the, the next requirement, I think, is Python interoperability. So I think pipes are great and everything, but they are by no means the, the only natural way to express everything. Uh, there's, of course, room for, for loops and conditionals and classes and, and so on. And uh, therefore, the idea isn't to create an external uh, tool that can, uh, that can parse your stuff and operate in it, but instead create a library that, that outputs valid uh, Python expressions, which you can use uh, together with all the other good constructs that the language uh, gives us. So here, for example, is, is an example that I, I personally think is uh, pretty cool of, of combining uh, pipes uh, together with uh, list comprehension. What it says here is that means is the result of the list comprehension of of letting i iterate over uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 9. And uh, uh, for each uh, such a uh, value, we open the, we open the numbered file uh, where it says uh, stream vals and, and the name of the file takes the number. And then we pipe on the results of the mean, which translates it into a single number. So this expression very, very concisely just creates a, a list of, of 10 uh, elements. OK, uh, the, the penultimate consideration is the relay to processing ratio. So uh, pipelines are used uh, in the design of other systems as well. For example, in, in the field of, uh, of web servers, so you can uh, conceptually design your system so that it's composed of a stage that, that accepts a, co a connection, then accepts a request. Uh, it authenticates it, assembles the response, sends it on, and, and so on. And I think that uh, what typifies uh, the, uh, these domains are that each stage uh, performs uh, relatively a lot of work. It might, might access uh, I.O. devices and so on, and at the end, it just passes a little bit of information to the following stage. So in, uh, in these domains, I'd say that there's a very low uh, relay to processing uh, ratio. We're, we're transferring very little data per, per amount of operation that each uh, stage is doing. But conversely, if you think of all the stages uh, uh, seen before, then, then uh, they need to pass a lot of information because relatively to what they're doing because each one of them does uh, so little. For example, consider a, a stage that performs the absolute value of, of things passed through it. So each time it gets a number, it, it calls the absolute value function and sends it on. Um, uh, it's really to processing ratio is very high. And therefore, uh, we have to make uh, sure that, that the mechanism of, of sending on the information from one stage to another should be very efficient because otherwise it won't, won't run efficiently at all. So the final consideration is uh, stage and uh, state uh, synchronization. So in general, we have to assume that, uh, that uh, stages are, are both uh, stateful and then synchronized. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, each uh, state, uh, or at least most of the stages, will have an internal state. And as elements are passed uh, through this uh, stage, then, then it'll change its internal uh, state. For example, uh, think about how you'd, uh, you would implement uh, a stage uh, implementing a correlation. So, so as x, y uh, tuples are sent to 2, 8, it needs to keep count of, of the powers of, of x, uh, the powers of y, the cross products, the number of elements uh, passed, uh, passed through it, and so on. It's, it's constantly a changing state, right? And uh, also, the stages uh, cannot be assumed to be synchronized. And uh, here's why. Uh, let's look at the case where we're trying to find the autocorrelation, uh, which, which means basically the correlation of a sequence uh, relative to itself uh, shifted, in this example, a uh, five time unit. So one way of doing it would be to write that we want to stream all of the values that are written in, in medio.csv and take the rain column. And then 
fan out the results uh, into uh, into uh, two uh, stages. Uh, one is a relay stage that, that just passes the information on without altering it. And the other one is a skip five stage that, that skips five inputs and then starts uh, transferring things on. And then we'd like to fan back the input into a correlation state, which actually performs the autocorrelation. So as far as these two stages are concerned, the relay and the skip five stage, uh, as far as they go, they're not transmitting like a, like a clockwork at each time unit uh, a result, right? Because the relay starts transferring stuff immediately, but but the skip five stage is, is waiting five time units before it begins. But if we look at it from the point of view of the correlation stage, then, then it expects to get the, the sequences aligned again. That, this is what we were logically trying to do. So we need to have a framework that's, that's smart enough to understand that and, and to resynchronize the things for us. The, the stages themselves cannot be assumed to be synchronized. Okay, so now that we have the usage uh, considerations, um, I'd like to show uh, the, the stuff that Python uh, lets us uh, use. So I'll begin with the last uh, consideration, wh wh which was that uh, the stages uh, have to be uh, stateful. So what we have here is a case where, where we have some uh, software entity and it's being fed uh, results. And as the results uh, uh, are fed into it, then it, it changes its internal uh, states. And how does Python allow us to encode, encode stuff like that that has internal state? Well, the, the classical approach would be to say, uh, let's use object-oriented programming, right? Because in object-oriented programming, we write a class and, and we create from the class uh, class objects. The class uh, objects have uh, uh, member variables, which are essentially the state. And uh, they have uh, methods, and when we call the, uh, these methods, then the class object reacts by changing its internal state. So classical object-oriented programming is one way of uh, doing it, and I'm going to call it the react method because it's, it's a very passive uh, approach, okay? It just reacts to whatever externally is called. Um, however, uh, uh, there are at least uh, two or three uh, other ways of, of doing it directly uh, through the language, and, and fortunately, uh, at least one of them was reviewed in, in the keynote uh, talk of, of the afternoon. So I'll review it only very shortly. Uh, one way of doing it is by using uh, generators. So generators allow us to write something that, that looks sequential. The code looks like uh, it's being executed just like a normal function. But, it's, but the execution is not, not necessarily sequential at all. And, and the, way, uh, the way it works is, is as follows. This, this by no means is, is a tutorial on, on generators. So in the context of this talk, uh, a generator in line one is, is something that we define just like a regular function. And it takes uh, some sequence, which, which in this talk is itself a generator as well, okay? And then in line two, it, it sets up its uh, variables, which I'll consider uh, to be its internal state. And then in lines uh, three and four, it, it loops uh, over all of the elements in uh, some sequence. And this is a bit like uh, calling a function in a way because each time uh, we're asking some sequence to give us, to pull, w each time we're asking to pull an element from uh, some sequence, then we're relinquishing uh, control to it and control will return to us only when an element is, is ready. Uh, each time an element is, is pulled by us, then we can update our own internal state in, in four. And then in uh, uh, line five, uh, uh, we can yield ourselves a value to someone that wants to pull a value from us. So this, uh, this yield uh, keyword is a bit like a return statement in the sense that it sends a value from, from this function or generator out, but it's not quite because when we return a value, then the next time the function is called, the execution begins all the way from the top. Whereas the yield keyword on the one hand returns a value, but on the other hand, it stays uh, at the exact position the next time it's called. So it retains its internal uh, state. So uh, maybe an example will, uh, will clarify it. Suppose we'd want to write a, a stage that performs uh, the absolute value, okay? It, it gets a sequence of numbers. And for example, if it would get, a, I'm sorry, not an absolute value, but rather cumulative uh, sum. It gets numbers and it yields on the sequence of the added uh, numbers. So if it gets, let's say one, two, three, and four, then it yields one and then three, which is one plus two, and then six, which is one plus two plus three, and, and so on. So how could we write that uh, using uh, using generators? Well, uh, we would uh, define the cumulative uh, sum in line one as, as something that takes a sequence. And then in line two, it, it initializes the sum variable to zero. And notice that sum is, the, is its internal state. And then in line uh, three and four, it, it, it pulls, it asks to pull all of the items and all of the elements in sequence. And for each one in four, it updates its uh, uh, internal uh, state and yields it on in, in five. 
so it's very easy and natural to write. Uh, it's very easy and natural to write to write stuff like that using generators. And a completely different way of uh, doing it is by doing uh, coroutines. So it's similar in the sense that again we have a writing style that looks uh, sequential, but but it doesn't have sequential execution, and and it looks something like this. A coroutine, at least in uh, this talk, is something that uh, sets its initial state. Uh, it gets in line one a target, which in this talk is is by itself a coroutine, and then in lines uh, in line four it it loops indefinitely as long as it can. And in line five, it asks uh, for uh, an element to be pushed to it using the parentheses uh, yield uh, keyword, which is different than the yield uh, keyword we've seen before. And this is a bit like a function being called, but not quite. It is like a function in the sense that some value is being passed from out of the function into, into where we're right now. But it's not like a function in the sense that we're staying at the exact position uh, where we are. Uh, the next time a value will be pushed, we won't start all over again from the top. And then in uh, line uh, six, we explicitly push on whatever uh, whatever we want onto the next uh, target, which is in itself a coroutine. So at some point, when we ask for a value to be pushed uh, to us, uh, there won't be any because all the elements have been uh, consumed. And then an exception will be thrown, and basically what we need to do in, in line uh, nine is, is to close uh, the target. So here's the same example from before of the cumulative uh, sum, but, but this time uh, written by, by coroutine. So um, uh, in line one, uh, we're defining a cumulative uh, sum to be something that takes a target, which is by itself a coroutine. And then in two, we're initializing uh, sum, the variable sum to be zero, which is the internal state. And then in uh, line four, we're looping for as long as we can. And each time we're asking for a value to be pushed to us via the parentheses yield keyword. In line six, we're updating the internal uh, state. We're saying that, that the sum variable is being incremented by the element just uh, pushed to us. And then in uh, seven, we're explicitly pushing the result on to, the partial result on to the following uh, coroutine. And, and of course, uh, as usual, at some point, there won't be ele any element uh, left. And, and at line eight, we'll catch the exception and close the uh, following uh, coroutine in line uh, nine. Okay, uh, there's another way of doing it. Using coroutines, it's, it's possible to, to build uh, basically a pretty full-blown uh, scheduler. And, and again, uh, you can check the talks by uh, David Beasley on how to do so. But for reasons I won't go into for lack of time, I, I think it's completely irrelevant in this, this context. Okay, so we've seen the usage uh, considerations and uh, the available language uh, constructs, at least three out, out of the four. And uh, now uh, let's combine both of them and, and see which, w which of uh, the three works for us. So let's begin uh, uh, with uh, React, the passive uh, object-oriented style. And, and as an example to show why this is not a good idea, I'm going to use a very, very simple stage, an absolute value stage, which uh, uh, basically uh, just uh, takes numbers and sends on their, their absolute values, okay? So, so if the sequence is one minus two minus three minus four, then what the stage uh, uh, should do is transform it into the one, two, three, and four. Okay, so here's the class that, uh, that would implement this uh, using an object-oriented approach, and look how much code it is. And I'd like uh, really, really uh, quickly just to go by, mainly, mainly to convince you that, that this isn't a good idea. So the first thing is uh, we unfortunately need to have a, a method that, that tells the framework wh whether a value at all is, is ready at the moment. Why? Because if you recall from the setting, uh, we cannot assume that stages are synchronized. So the framework can't say, give me the next element. It needs to ask, do you at all have an element ready? And in line 13, uh, uh, in order to answer that, we need to have a, a member variable, which, which remembers if an element is ready or not. And once we have uh, member variables, then, then of course we need a constructor to initialize them. Okay, now when the framework actually does ask for a value, then it's nice to assert that a value is ready. Uh, before we return the value, we need to indicate that, that no more value is ready because right now we're sending it and so it's uh, consumed. And when we push a value uh, uh, to it, then, then we need to update the variable to say, yes, we do have a variable uh, ready now. And finally, in line uh, seven, we, we do that actual uh, uh, absolute value transformation. And finally, we need to also to have something like a closed method because some uh, terminal stages, uh, like, like a correlation stage or a mean stage and so on, perform their useful work only, only when uh, they know that no more input is, is coming again and it's time to go to the actual calculation. So I think this, uh, I think this is pretty terrible. I mean, it's, it's a bit ridiculous. Uh, look here at line seven. Line seven is the only payload uh, code in, in this thing. It's the only one actually uh, doing some useful code of, 
of doing uh, the, the absolute value in this case. All of the rest of it is just maintenance. So the overhead of this thing is, is terrible, both in terms of, uh, of the code overhead, uh, how much the coder needs to write until he can get a state working, and uh, in terms of the execution time, the framework, the framework needs to manipulate all these, all these flags all the time for, for no reason. So I'd say at this point that the, the React uh, approach is, is dead. Uh, let's move on to uh, the, the full style generator based approach, uh, which looks uh, better. So here's the same absolute value stage, and it, it looks like something like this. In, in line uh, two, we're defining it, and it takes a sequence. And then in uh, line three, it loops over all the elements of the sequence, and for each one of them, it simply yields on the result. So uh, in terms of uh, clarity, this is great. I mean, there's very little overhead. I mean, basically, we're saying here the minimum of, of how we would describe it orally, right? Take the sequence, uh, take each element, and yield on the absolute value. It looks really good. Uh, another uh, uh, cool thing we get from the generator approach is, is free left associativity because remember that we're not aiming here for an external tool but rather something that, that, uh, that the interpreter can process. So let's look uh, for example at what happens when, uh, when uh, we uh, stream the values of some uh, file onto an absolute value stage and, and stream it on into a mean stage and I'd like to look at it from the point of view of the absolute value stage we've seen before. So if you look at line one it's, uh, the code is uh, the absolute value uh, takes a sequence, and the sequence in this case is stream vals, the stage that precedes it. So this is very nice because uh, what it means is that each time uh, we, we create a, a stage, the stage before it needs to be ready at this time because it's expecting it as an input. And uh, the, the Python interpreter actually uh, interprets uh, pipes using a left to right associativity. So that's really nice. And at this point, it looks like uh, like uh, generators are our answer to everything, but I'd like to argue that actually they, they completely fail in, in this setting, and the reason is that we cannot perform uh, fanning out in, uh, in any reasonable way. Uh, in order to fan out a result, we essentially would have to copy the entire data stream into memory. And before I explain why, I'd, I'd like to point out that why this is a deal breaker, because uh, without the ability to stream out, uh, to fan out uh, values, then we have no way of, of doing multiple aggregates on a file. It means that instead of uh, being able, able to do one pass on a file and, and to both calculate the mean and the standard deviation using the, the easy notation we've seen before, we have to go over the file as, as many aggregates as, as we want, which is, which is really bad. So what's the reason that we really have to, um, what's the reason uh, that causes the fact that, that we need to copy everything in, into memory? Uh, well, it's basically a uh, part of the language, as far as I, I understand. Uh, if you look at uh, stage uh, zero being fanned on to, to stage one and uh, stage two, and we look at it from the point of view of stage one, then internally we saw the code will look something like, for E in sequence, do something. So what it says here really is that as long as, uh, as, long as the sequence, uh, as long as elements are coming in from, from sequence zero, then I'm not relinquishing control, I'm doing something on. And the first time control is relinquished is when no more elements are coming. But if no more elements are coming, then it means that the sequence has been consumed and, and there's nothing left uh, to send on to stage two. So the only way uh, to handle this would be by the framework to recognize that a fanning out is occurring and to insert an intermediate stage, which basically would take all the results for all the elements passed from stage uh, zero, make a copy of them in memory, and then uh, use this copy in memory in order to to send on the results to, to one after another. But, but of course, using contemporary data sets, any, any framework that requires you to load everything into memory is not, not exactly a good thing. I think I'm running out, of, uh, running out of time. Okay, so unfortunately, I'm running out of, uh, out of time. Um, basically, uh, I, I'll just uh, do a highlight of a uh, high-level overview of what I was uh, going to do. Um, the, the coroutine-based approach has, uh, has some problems on its own. It's, its associativity is right to left, and also it has some problems uh, with Fanon. But however, these, uh, these obstacles uh, can be solved. And, and in fact, I've written a framework which, which you're very welcome uh, to use, which, which does it. And um, I also uh, have some uh, performance results that, that show that in, in many settings, it's much more... Uh, efficient than, than just using plain old NumPy or, or C. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, time to do that. So um, if you're a data practitioner, then there's a good chance that, that a lot of your time is, is spent just trying to figure out 
what you what you want to learn in the first place from some data that comes from horrible uh, formatted files. And in this case, I think a library such as this uh, could be useful to you. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I'm really sorry about the lack of time for, for questions. Thank you. Uh, we can, uh, I think we can still have one or two questions. Okay. So any any questions? I remember from David's um, um, introduction about this that for a coroutine, uh, you you, n you need some kind of a decorator so that it Absolutely. that you can use it uh, in a, in a handy fashion. I didn't see that on on the. Right. Uh, you're do you okay. use that then also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a that's a great uh, that's a really good point. And uh, the thing is, I, I cheated a bit because okay. I was trying to simplify the presentation, but, but then the, I decorators, understand. the decorators are there. Oh, okay. I, I, can you hear me okay? Uh, I, I actually just wanted to make another comment on the, on the push approach that I think is, is interesting and overlooked. Is that it has a really nice tie-in to distributed computing mm -hmm. and things like the actor model and all sorts of stuff because it's like you can start fanning out to like multiple machines and like scaling things up you know it's like you're not confined to a single cpu and it like works really great for that so great thanks so thank you very much thank you very much for